Hello. In this video, I'm going to have a look at the classic article by Henry Midsberg and James Waters called Of Strategies Deliberate and Emergent. It appeared in the Strategic Management Journal in 1985. The article reflects a decade of their research on the reality of how strategy is developed and is part of an ongoing critique that Mintzberg and his various fellow authors had of the traditional linear planning approach to strategy development. This later culminated in Mintzberg's stinging attack in 1994 with his book The Rise and Fall of Strategic Planning. However, in the 1985 article, there is a recognition that strategy comes through both a planned intent and patterns that surface in an organisation. As elsewhere in strategy, there are disagreements amongst theorists, but different viewpoints, in this case deliberate and emergent, provide different lenses to help us understand and armed with the insights from both, make better decisions. Mintzberg and Waters start by observing that strategy is often, by default, thought of in terms of what leaders of an organisation plan to do in the future. As a result, its development has tended to be seen as an analytical process for establishing long-range goals and action plans. Implementation then follows from this formulation stage. Talk to most managers and students about how strategy should be developed and they will suggest a deliberate process of analysis, plan, implement. However, the author's research and experience of managers suggests this is a very limited view. Strategy takes shape in a variety of ways and we need a wider perspective to fully understand the process. Mintzberg and Waters broadened this lens by defining strategy not as a plan of action, but as a pattern in a stream of actions. Then they look to explore the relationship between leaders' plans and the intentions with what the organisation actually did. So what was the leadership's intended strategy and what was then its realised strategy? They envisaged leadership intending a strategy, but as it attempts its delivery, some elements are realised while others are unrealised. At the same time, due to the environment and adjustment of people in the organisation, other parts of the realised strategy emerge Hence, the realised strategy is some combination of deliberate and emergent elements. Mintzberg and Waters argue that for a strategy to be perfectly deliberate, that is, the realised pattern of actions being exactly as intended, three conditions need to be satisfied. Firstly, precise intentions must have existed and be clearly articulated before action is taken. Secondly, intentions have to be common to all actors in the organisation, either of their own intent or in response to some sort of control. And thirdly, no external force should have interfered with the intention. The environment must have been either perfectly predictable, benign, or under the full control of the organisation. The authors say that these conditions are rare. It is very unlikely to find any perfectly deliberate strategies in organisation, although some do get close on some dimensions. For strategies to be perfectly emergent is also highly unlikely. An emergent strategy means there is still a pattern of realised actions. With no pattern, there is no strategy. And it is difficult to envisage a pattern coming into being with the complete absence of any intention from the leadership itself 
or some other pocket in the organisation. Again, the author's research shows that some strategies do get close, especially when an environment directly imposes a pattern on what the organisation does. We should see these poles perfectly deliberate and perfectly emergent as two ends of a continuum along which we would expect real-world strategies to fall, each a combination of deliberate and emergent, so containing more or less explicit intentions that are more or less pervasive across the firm and more or less influenced by the environment. Mintzberg and Waters proceed then to describe eight types of strategy that they observed in their research that spread out along this continuum. They term the most deliberate strategy type as planned. Here strategy originates in formal detailed plans created and articulated by central leadership and backed up by formal control. Thus, there is a clear and precise set of intentions and implementation is surprise-free due to a benign or predictable environment. Some strategies do come close to this, especially where an organisation must commit large quantities of resources, for example, for a power station in mining or in an airline company buying planes. Note, however, the degree of deliberateness is not a measure of the potential or the success of a strategy. There are examples of successfully planned strategies and of disasters. In the next two strategy types, entrepreneurial and ideological, the authors see a reduction in the level to which intention is articulated. Intentions does still exist either as a personal vision of an individual or as a collective vision of all actors. In both, control is strong, either through the personal impact of the leader or as normative pressure via indoctrination and socialisation of the vision. In both cases, strategy is therefore relatively deliberate. As the intention is less articulated by the leader in the entrepreneurial type, he or she is able to reformulate the vision and change direction as learning emerges. In an ideological type, the vision is shared in the collective mind and so is often institutionalised and so more difficult to change. The fourth strategy type the authors describe is umbrella strategy. Here they reduce the condition of tight control that is expected in a deliberate strategy. Leadership has partial control over the actions followed in the organisation. They define strategic boundaries and or targets within which other actors contribute or react to, say, a complex, unpredictable environment. Hence, strategy is only partly deliberate. It's also deliberately emergent. In some sense, virtually all real-world strategies have umbrella characteristics. Central leadership can never fully preempt the discretion of others, but nor would it totally defer to others. Central leadership has some sort of intention and tries to direct cajole and nudge others who have minds and expertise of their own. Where leadership can direct strategy, it is more planned or entrepreneurial. Where it can hardly nudge, it moves to the realm of emergent strategies. In pursuing an umbrella strategy, central leadership must monitor behaviours of others to assess if the set boundaries are being respected searching for anomalies in the streams of actions. Where actors are found to stray, leadership has the choice of stopping them, ignoring them or adjusting to them. So, has that variation produced strategic learning? 
To maintain an umbrella strategy, therefore, needs a balance between being in control and allowing adjustment. Mintzberg and Water's fifth type of strategy they call process strategy. This has similar characteristics to the umbrella strategy, but rather than seeking to control strategy content via boundaries and targets, it controls the process of strategy and decision making. So it leaves the content of strategy to other actors better positioned to choose. So central leadership designs the system and allows others the flexibility to evolve patterns as they follow the process. Often, decentralised multi-divisional companies work this way, with central headquarters establishing the basic structure and control systems, then appointing divisional managers who are expected to develop effective strategies. In the sixth type of strategy, which the authors entitle Unconnected, Strategy originates in loosely coupled enclaves within the organisation. If there is a central or common intention, the emerging strategy is in contradiction to it. While at the level of the whole organisation there is no obvious intention behind the pattern of action seen, within the enclave the strategy could be deliberate or emergent. Indeed, to minimise risk of exposure, even if deliberate, proponents of an unconnected strategy may act as if it's emergent. In the seventh strategy type, consensus strategy, Mitzberg and Waters drop the condition for there being any prior intention. So this type is clearly emergent. Here, many different actors naturally converge on the same themes or patterns so that it becomes pervasive across the organisation without the need for any central direction or control. Strategy, the pattern of realised action, grows out of mutual adjustment among different people as they learn from each other and respond to the environment. The right idea comes along and consensus crystallises. So strategy derives from collective action rather than from collective intentions. The final type Mintzberg and Waters describe is the imposed strategy. In all the previous types, strategy derives in part, at least, from the will of actors in the organisation. The environment, if not benign, at least allows the strategy to form. But strategy can be imposed from outside as well, directly forcing the organisation into a pattern of activities regardless of the presence of its own intentions and controls. This could be highly explicit, perhaps in a nationalised organisation or the competitive environment severely restricting the options open to the firm, so the outcome is inescapable. This form of strategy is the most emergent, although in accepting its fate, the organisation might internalise the patterns of activities and so make the strategy deliberate. Reality seems to be a compromise between determinism and free choice. Environments seldom preempt all choices, just as they rarely offer unlimited choice. Thus, just as the umbrella strategy may be the most realistic reflection of leadership intention, so might partially imposed strategy be the most realistic reflection of the environmental influence. Having illustrated the continuum between purely deliberate and purely emergent strategies with their eight types, Mintzberg and Waters hypothesise how different organisations and strategy content might fit more or less deliberate and emergent approaches. 
Will more tightly controlled and centralised firms be more deliberate than those decentralised with high degrees of autonomy? Will a cost leadership strategy be aligned with more deliberate types, while differentiation more emergent? In this, they encourage more research to understand specific blending across the types of strategy described. Finally, Mintzberg and Waters turn their attention to how managers and organisations learn. In their view, the fundamental difference between deliberate and emergent strategy is that while the former focuses on direction and control, getting things done, the latter opens up the notion of strategic learning. In a deliberate approach, once intentions are set, attention is riveted onto realising them, not adapting them, and messages from the environment are likely to be blocked out or ignored. Emergent strategy implies taking one action at a time to develop not chaos, but an unintended order. The organisation is open, flexible and responsive, allowing management to act before everything is fully understood. Perhaps management cannot be close enough to understand the complexity or can never be well enough informed to shape detailed strategies. By the same token, deliberate strategy is not dysfunctional either. Managers need to manage too. Sometimes there is a need to impose intentions and provide a sense of direction. This can be partial, as in the case of umbrella and process strategies, or rather comprehensive, as is the case in planned and entrepreneurial strategies. Where the information needed is available centrally and the environment is largely understood and predictable, then it may be appropriate to suspend strategic learning and act with as much determination as possible. Summing up the article, Mintzberg and Waters' view is that strategy formulation walks on two feet, one deliberate and one emergent. Managers need to direct in order to realise intentions, while at the same time responding to an unfolding pattern of action. But the relative emphasis between the two will shift from time to time and with context, but you need both. So what do we make of Mintzberg and Waters' article? Well, firstly, the traditional view that strategy comes from just a deliberate approach seems flawed. Given the depth and definition you need of intent and that everyone has to be following it, it does not seem to fit with human nature or the complexity of the environment or a firm. So it's not surprising that organisations' plans do not turn out as expected. But equally, the opposite view of no intention at all is equally unlikely. Leadership, whether hierarchical, professional or political, will seek outcomes they believe in. So there is always likely to be some intent, even if not articulated and put into plans. We also need to think about the external environment of the firm. Detailed, deliberate strategic plans assumes the environment does not influence the intent or the way people seek to achieve their aims. But the sheer multiplicity of factors and chance events suggest that predicting the environment will only ever be partially accurate at best. So detailed planning is likely to miss things. As Minsberg and Waters say, real-world strategies are likely to be a combination of deliberate and emergent, with a degree of direction and control while still being adaptive as the organisation learns. Even if this is a simple feedback loop 
from realised strategy to intended strategy. So it is not about selecting whether to be deliberate or emergent. The challenge is getting the balance right, such that the combination of deliberate strategy and the pattern bubbling up from the day-to-day -day learning in business as usual has the most chance of success. As such, we need to think about what insight each of these lenses gives us and synthesise that understanding into our decisions. Thank you for listening.